So thank you, Chris. You just introduced to everybody the amazing impact of what you all have been doing on our community. Um, I like the way, Dave, that you talked about how it's focused locally, which is so important. Um, and I really love seeing um, Joan and Manuel together and um, seeing that relationship. And you can really see that Manuel has this person supporting him um, and helping him grow. Uh, I want to focus on something just a little bit different uh, because there's another population who's being impacted by this program, and that is all that is all of you volunteers. So you can go ahead. So here you are. Volunteers are another important group who are being changed by your experience with Opportunity St. Paul. Um, so I know you're not here and doing this kind of work for your own benefit, right? But raise your hand if, at least in part, you know that volunteering is good for you. Okay, so you all are right. Um, and I had the joy of looking through the literature and seeing that there is actually a large research base that demonstrates the positive impact of volunteering on the people who volunteer themselves. So I want to share just a little bit with you. Um, so what overall the general consensus and what the research shows is that volunteering has a positive impact both on physical health and mental well-being. So I'm going to build my next, my next slide. There we go. Volunteering makes volunteers happier and healthier. So let me just share a little bit about this. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to understand the mental health side, I think, that people who volunteer feel more socially connected and through those connections um, are, feel less lonely, are less likely to have, be depressed. Um, there's many positive things that happen to you and uh, the way that you are feeling emotionally. But I found it really interesting that there's a growing body of research demonstrating that there's actually an impact on volunteers' physical health as well. Uh, so one study I found showed that adults over the age of 50 who volunteer on a regular basis are less likely to develop high blood pressure than people who don't volunteer. Um, and as we know, high blood pressure is associated with heart disease and stroke and premature death, all things that we want to avoid. So you're doing that for yourself. Um, another study I found is that showed that um, volunteer positions that are mentally stimulating, particularly things like tutoring, um, are associated with better memory and cognitive ability. Uh, another study found associations between volunteering and stress reduction. And as we know, reducing stress helps us both mentally and um, our physical health as well. And there are even some studies that suggest that people who volunteer live longer than people who don't volunteer. So that's great for you and great for our community, meaning you can volunteer longer <laughs> and have even a bigger impact. <laughs> So it's no surprise then that many gerontologists and others um, believe that volunteering is really good for people as they age, um, and it's a way of acting and feeling younger. So again, volunteering is not only good for the people who you're working with, but it's good for you as well. So thank you for all that you're doing, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Leah. One of the lenses uh, that we look at our programs through is strengthening the faith community. And we at Opportunity St. Paul take that very serious as that is one of the reasons why we brought in Anchor Houses of Worship. We currently have eight Anchor Houses of Worship with a nine, actually I'm gonna say 10 because I'm about to close two more churches here this summer. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go with 10 Anchor Houses of Worship. Thank you very much, Father Rotten. You're my own cheerleader tonight. Um, and they help us to increase our volunteerism, increase the number of volunteers we have. And so we wanted to welcome Diane and Florence to come up and join us from St. Anthony Park United Church of Christ. And they're gonna share a little bit about how they took some of the learning community event that we did right away in the fall, and they brought it back to their congregation and had an experience with them. So Diane and Florence, come on up. I don't think I came quite as prepared as, as some of these other people. I don't, I don't. So anyhow, we are from St. Anthony Park UCC, and St. Anthony Park, as you probably know, is the neighborhood just west of the fairgrounds. So that's where the church is located. UCC means we're a pretty liberal, uh, mainstream Protestant church. So we are open and affirming, which is our phrase for saying we welcome people of all uh, gender and sexual orientations. Um, and we've had a lot of 
social activist uh, programs over the years, working with loaves and fishes and uh, other programs. But we're a small, con small enough congregation that we can't really create our own programs. And sometimes it's good to have partners to work with. And this has been a very good opportunity for us to try and connect people, the people power that we might have, with places that they can contribute in their community in a very individual, a very personal way. And we don't have to have 15 people on Sunday afternoon <laughs> to be somewhere. You can fit it into your schedule and what you like to do and the ways you like to contribute. And I think for those of us who've been doing it, it's been very valuable. And one thing we've really enjoyed are these learning community events. So, so uh, from the start, I think um, our congregation thought that we should bring some information back to share with everyone else. And we have a Sunday forum for adults uh, before our service that's an hour long, and they're always looking for topics. So when we went to the uh, learning um, event night and did the uh, simulation on the computers, um, it was just tremendous. It had so much impact on us. It was such a wonderful way to really think about what it would be like to live in poverty that we said, oh, well, we could do that yeah. <laughs> for the forum. And that's what we did. Uh, it worked out really well. We had lots of volunteers to bring their laptops. We had small groups. We had wonderful conversation. Um, people were at all different levels in terms of how they've maybe experienced mm -hmm or have not experienced poverty in their own lives. So um, good discussion. Uh, we found that we didn't have enough time in one hour. And, um, but it really, we wanted to bring that strong impact back um, to our community. Uh, we also did in the spring another session where um, our pastor Victoria sort of interviewed us and we talked about our individual experiences at our different sites. And I think at that point, we started gaining quite a bit of interest in, by more people. And we've had five people that have stuck with the volunteering, and we have five people here tonight that have come to learn more. So we're pretty excited about what we can do in helping our congregation to increase their numbers. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think one thing I've been thinking about when I, she said, introduce your congregation, I was thinking we're really a very fortunate congregation because in my perception, the majority of our, our members are economically stable, but it was interesting to hear in the conversations around play spent, people coming out and saying, well, my kids get Medicaid, you know, my kids are on this because we don't have you know, uh, uh, employer-sponsored insurance, and we are using this. You know, we we are some of these people, and then other people. But so you get the whole range of people. People saying, "Well, oh, I know where there's a service for this and this and this," and it's kind of like saying, "Yeah, but could you get to it? Could you know? Could you take time off work? Do you have transportation? Do you have childcare?" And you know about it, but does everybody else know about it? So the conversations were very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to have brought a lot of learning back, I think, to our communities and look forward to doing more of that and are really thankful for the cohort that we're a part of um, that's helped to really, I think, make stronger connections between us as uh, people who are volunteering but then also that connection out to the community more because of the things we can bring back. So, yep. Thank you. As we are talking about uh, our faith, I want to quick have us recognize and give a quick thank you to Earl Schwartz, who has written our curriculum for our interfaith text study. And he has um, helped bring in Bashir, who was one of his students, and also bring in Deanna Thompson, who is one of his colleagues. So can we just give Earl a quick round of applause? Thank you. Many volunteers have shared that the text study and the time of talking about and learning about each other's faith has been one of the reasons why 
people come to learning events, and I think that's awesome. Um, we do have a couple folks just sneaking out, so I'm going to just take a quick pause to let them. They've got a big meeting at their synagogue, which they've got to go to, so we wish them well. If I'll do a plug for an Anchor House of Worship. If you are part of a faith community that's not represented as one of our Anchor House, please come and talk to me or Randy or give me, you know, give me a call or an email. I am also adding on to my um, long list of wonderful things I get to do as working on our membership and our congregational engagement coming up now. And so I get to have the honor to go visit churches. So if your church doesn't know about Interfaith or Opportunity St. Paul, please let me know because I would love to come and visit and get to know them and get to know your congregation. Um, it's one of the great things I get to do. As we've talked about the community, the localness, and the relationships that we've built, it's time to talk about how we engage our community. And I get the honor of welcoming Eric and Charlotte to come up and share their story from the St. Paul Public Library perspective. So come, there's like one's over there, one's over here. Come on up. Give them a round of applause. Right. One step closer to the microphone. Cool, thanks Sarah. You're welcome. Uh, Earl Schwartz might not know this, but I had him as a professor back in college, too, so it was pretty cool to see that he's connected to the interfaith community as well. Um, so the last uh, speaker was just talking about relationships, um, and relationships are truly the core of community engagement as well. Um, community engagement is about meeting people in your neighborhood and talking to each other. Um, just by interacting with people at the public library, for example, uh, you may learn some words from the Somali language as kids are shouting to their parents and vice versa. <laughs> um, you may learn about some family dynamics in different cultures and how they're different than yours, but you'll also recognize uh, many similarities to your own family, like how parents from all different backgrounds struggle to get their kids to put their phone or video games down for, <laughs> for two seconds so they can read a book or go outside and be active. These are across cultures, you know. Um, you may have gotten to try some delicious new food as appreciative parents uh, bring in sambusas or Somali tea as a way to share uh, with their community in a way of saying thanks to the volunteers as happens at the library. Um, you may learn about some truly harrowing experiences that your neighbors and uh, their parents or their grandparents have experienced in their home countries before deciding to come to the United States. Um, and you may get some insider tips on which Vietnamese and Thai restaurants and Hmong supermarkets are the best ones to visit. <laughs> and you learn all these things without having to try. These are just things that come up naturally when you engage with your community. You come to do tutoring and to talk about math and writing, but you learn these things about your community without even having to try, and they learn things from you from the other perspective as well. Um, so I know that each and every one of our volunteers has grown as a person due to their engagement in the community through volunteering. Um, for example, I don't know anybody who has built such meaningful relationships with the students at the library as Charlotte here. Um, she's a tutor at the Rondo Library Homework Center just down the street. Um, and she has a lot of regulars uh, who when they see each other, when they see Charlotte walk in each week, uh, I see big smiles, there's hugging asking about what's going on in each other's lives. We're talking about the Como High School wrestling team and other stuff like that. Um, that has nothing to do with what they're here to do, you know. Um, and then they get down to business working on homework. So um, I know that what Charlotte and the other volunteers have gained from these interactions is almost equally as valuable as the academic concepts that the students are learning while they're analyzing texts or doing math homework. Um, on their journey through high school and then maybe college someday. So um, since Charlotte exemplifies the ideal level of community engagement to me, I invited her to come and speak a bit about her experiences engaging with the community at Rondo. Thank you. And actually, it was it's a treat to me that I actually ended up at Rondo. And when it was when I was invited and encouraged to join Opportunity St. Paul, I, I looked at the, the choices and I thought, well, yeah, I could tutor. I like turning math the best. And I chose Rondo because 
I live in the northwest corner of St. Paul. I have three sons that went through Como High School, and I thought if there's a chance that I could make a connection with somebody, it would probably be Rondo Library. And for me, learning and teaching, it's really about relationships. And I can speak from as a kid, I was hooked on subjects when I knew that teachers valued me. They were glad that I was there. And I came from this family that education was a really big deal and, and it just was a really big thing for me as a kid. Um, and so I, the first day when I arrived at Rondo, I sat down with this uh, ninth grader from, and she was from Como High School. <laughs> and we were gonna be working on algebra. And as we were working and I'm chatting and I asked who, my, now my kids, my youngest one's 32, so it's been a while since they were there, but I asked who some of the teachers were and she mentioned this one gal, Miss Susan's, and I said, oh, she teaches French. A couple of my kids had her and I said, would you tell her I said hello? And then I thought, how is she gonna remember this? So I, half a sheet of ripped off paper, I wrote my name and wrote Miss Susan's a little note and said, you know, my kids were the Vanderweg boys and, and, uh, and so, you know, and so, hello. <laughs> and the next Tuesday I arrived there and here with this little gal, she waved to me. She had a note <laughs> to me. <laughs> and then, um, and there have been quite a few kids. That that's our little connection. And then I hadn't even thought about the fact that one of my sons is the wrestling coach at Como. <laughs> Oh, so we've talked athletics, we've talked specifically wrestling. I've taken numbers, you know, past phone numbers around, um, old students, kids that had gone to Como. That There was one student that actually is a tutor at Rondo, and he was just finishing his degree at the University of Minnesota. And the, what he wanted to go into um, I was thinking of the new athletic director at Como who happened to work at Harding High School and the, this kid knew him from Harding as a high school student. And so, boy, was I right on email, sending this, you know, trying to make them connected. And it's just, I don't, I know I don't need to tell anybody here how valuable this is. Um, and I'm just one little step off from the two little things. First of all, I taught for many years in Moundsview High School, at Moundsview High School in the Moundsview District, and I loved to go to staff development. And there would be, for years, there was this little saying, it's not unique to Moundsview, but a lot of the teachers teaching staff would say, well, you know, kids don't care what you know until they know that you care. <laughs> Good philosophy. And then David Meisner and I were talking a couple years ago, and he said, you know, there's a saying at 3M, and it's, I think I've got it right, respect plus interest equals influence. Mm -hmm. And one other little thing, you know, we think of it as, you know, all what, what we're talking about, but I read this article, it was at, um, maybe in about 2005, and it was an article in Newsweek magazine, and there's a man, um, his name is Richard Light, L-I-G-H-T, and he taught for many years, I don't know if he's still there, at Harvard in the in graduate school for education. And at some point at the end of the 80s, the president of Harvard said, would you do a little survey about what makes these students successful? So you think Harvard, you know, aren't all kids, all young people at Harvard, especially the graduate school, successful? Well, for 10 years, he interviewed kids. and. And it was, I think, it sounded like it was rather loose, but I mean, just talked with kids. And he named five things that you could do. And three of them had to do with connections. And one of them, one of those three was um, every semester, choose an instructor or professor that you want to get to know better. And in, at the end of four years, at the end of four years, you will have eight professors that you know well. Even if you'd only do it half the time, at least you've got four. Mm -hmm. um, another one was being involved in extracurricular, co-curricular activities and the bonds you create from that. And the other one was, rather than starting out as freshmen 
taking the basic classes that you need, which are frequently in the larger um, like lectures, students should start out with small classes. The kids that did that were the happiest. And once again, it was because of those relationships. And the extracurricular, co-curricular activities, they were the happiest too. So, you know, I'm, I know I'm not telling you anything new, but it's, you know, it's for all of us. So, thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you both. Networking and community building and these ripples that we are starting are going, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you can see and as we hear from each of these speakers. But what's next? What's this larger impact in Opportunity St. Paul and these volunteer hours that we are doing? I'd like to invite Vanessa Edwards up from Neighborhood House and she's going to share a little bit of that with us. Thank you. So she said, I'm Vanessa, I'm from Neighborhood House, and our Opportunity St. Paul volunteers are in our adult education program. And I'm going to talk just a little bit more about the long-term impact of our work that we do together. As our name suggests, we, what we are really working toward is increased opportunity for education, for employment, and for engagement in our community. To understand if we are having impact, in increasing opportunities in these areas, we first need to talk about the gaps. For our adult education participants, the gaps are real and felt on a daily basis. Language and literacy gaps affect everyday tasks, whether that's going to the doctor, trying to have a parent-teacher conference, reading mail, paying bills, applying for a job, or even just asking a question at the grocery store. Education gaps create income gaps. In Ramsey County, full-time workers without a high school diploma have a median weekly income of $515, but a two-parent, two-child home requires $898 a week just for the bare minimum. So that's $515, $898, that's a gap. Another gap you may not think about is actually digital inclusion gaps, including both access to technology and the skills to use it. On the west side where Neighborhood House is located, only 60 to 70 percent of the households have broadband access. So how do we make an impact in closing, bridging, and filling these gaps? It's really a combination of gaining skills and gaining access. In terms of language and literacy skills, one way we measure growth is by measuring level gains. So for us, that's beginner, intermediate, uh, beginning to intermediate, and intermediate to advanced. Last year at Neighborhood House, 113 students made level gains. Woohoo! Um, this is the kind of data that we're required to report at a state and federal level, but my staff really wanted me to tell you guys that although these numbers are important, sometimes uh, it doesn't fully capture the whole picture of progress that our students are making. There's also a lot of small successes that show students are improving. For example, 60 students. 60 students reported that they had made a phone call, scheduled, maybe that's one wrong right there, <laughs> right? Scheduled an appointment or wrote an email in English. 62 students said that they were able to help their children with their homework, and that is actually a goal that we hear a lot from our participants. In terms of gains in education and employment, 72% of our students reported meeting a job-related goal, meaning that they applied for a job, they retained their employment, or they earned a promotion. In May, we had four students who were accepted to college, and they have started or will start by the end of the summer. Five students passed all four of the GED tests, while we had 10 students who all passed at least one. Additionally, we had 12 students that became U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> Finally, in terms of digital access and literacy, our student, students learn how to use the internet, send email, and use Microsoft Office programs. So we've talked about the gaps, we've talked about the gains, um, and now I just want to share briefly and close uh, with a story that one of, our, one of my coworkers wrote about one of our participants that uh, I think will show you a little bit more about impact as well. Shame enrolled in Neighborhood House's beginning literacy class three years ago with minimal English vocabulary and no previous school experience. 
Because the English class was the first time Shame had been to school, she didn't know how to write any letters or fill out worksheets. She and her teachers really struggled to understand each other because of the language barrier. Nevertheless, Shame came to school every day and tried her best, even though she was struggling to keep up. With the support of Neighborhood House's teaching staff and dedicated volunteers, she has built up several essential skills, received an attendance award, and has made tremendous gains on her journey to read, write, and understand English. Shame has now moved out of the beginning literacy class to the intermediate class. She is able to form all of her letters, fill out most worksheets, have simple conversations, and read in English. She is able to communicate with her children's teachers, make purchases at local stores, and navigate her new community. Shame hopes to continue taking English classes until she is fluent and comes to class excited to improve her English every day. Thank you for choosing to be a part of this work and the long-term impact. I am going to invite Randy to come up here and kind of close us out. Um, after we're kind of done with Randy's piece, those guests who are here tonight who are still checking us out, please feel free to grab one of these folders. It has all of our information in it. So you can think about joining us in the fall, or if you have any questions, my contact information is in there as well. Randy? Thank you very much, Sarah. I, I have to say, um, I, I'm with you guys like every day, different combinations of you. And I've been to every data session, and I'm like blown away. You know, as, as I heard this, it's just, it has energy, it's real, it's real in people's lives. We've heard so much about impact, and we've heard so much about localness. Thank you, Dave. Um, I just want to let you know that although our focus is local, we're starting to hear from people in other parts of the country who want to come learn what we're doing and copy it for their communities. So for example, a church reached out to us from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Their faith community became outraged at child poverty in their community. And their faith community said, it's the faith community that has to take the lead in doing something about this. The pastor of that church, Pastor Tom Evans, called us, asked us to explain how the whole thing works and to write it up if we can, which we're working on. And he's going to bring a delegation from his church here in the fall to study with us and learn with us so he can bring it back there. And I just want to see, are you as inspired as I was by the statement they issued at that church is their call to action. So here it is, and what I'd like us to do is take turns, read one paragraph, and go to the next person who's willing to read with a loud voice, because it's that kind of room. And I'd like to ask uh, Father Rutten, would you please start for us? She knows I have a big mouth. <laughs> Our congregation, First Presbyterian Church of Spartanburg, like yours, is filled with loving people who want to help others. Over the years, in partnership with other faith communities to help those in need, we have established ministries like Mobile Meals and St. Luke's Free Medical Clinic. For too long, we have been satisfied with meeting immediate needs, but failed to work on sustainable change. This is not enough. It has never been enough. Someone else? Joan, you want to come up? Okay. 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 Who wants to come up with a big voice for the next paragraph? We've got two over there. Yeah. Please. And whoever wants to be next, kind of line up. Yeah. There's your mic. That that whole paragraph, and then that's the, the end. Yeah. Come right up here. Recent. Lee, the Racial Equity Index has exposed deep ills within our town. Number one, 45.7% of children in this city live in poverty. Number two, 
Blacks are three times as likely to live in poverty as whites. Number three, the wage gap for black and Latina women shows that they are paid less than 57 cents for every dollar paid to their white male counterparts. Poverty and racism are an offense to God. Data from reliable sources indicates that the life expectancy of a child born today less than two miles northwest of our sanctuary is 68.2 years, while a child born two miles to our southeast is 85.3 years, a difference of over 17 years. As a session, we resolved to take sustained, bold action to transform Spartanburg fully into God's intentions. No longer will we accept systems and structures that disadvantage people according to race, gender, and economic status. Mm -hmm. We further resolve to work fervently to transform the structures that perpetuate poverty and racism. We pray God will give us the strength and wisdom to fully love our neighbors as ourselves. We will seek to open our hearts to our Lord's radical love for everyone and grow our personal relationships with those from different racial and economic backgrounds than our own. We challenge other faith communities, government agencies, businesses, and nonprofits to the radical love and self-giving that will allow all children to thrive. We remind ourselves that scripture wants us that it were better to hang a millstone around our neck than to be stumbling block before the youngest and most vulnerable of society. Luke 17, 2. The sheer magnitude of these statistics shows that no one group can achieve what is necessary. It will take all of Spartanburg to act with courage, fortitude, and self-giving love to begin to make a difference. Let us all commit to work to transform our town so that it may be truly said that we love God with everything we've got by radically loving and standing in solidarity with those in deepest need. Thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So one thing we can look forward to next fall is to have their team with us, talking to us, learning with us as they're trying to figure out how to bring this to Spartanburg. Um, also, there's a lot of interest in a similar effort in Southwest Minnesota. And today I spoke to a church in Boston that's interested in learning and possibly replicating. It has been a great privilege to be in this work with you uh, during this year and the year before. I have two calls to action for you tonight. The first is recommit. You're gonna get these yellow cards that ask, do you wanna be in next year? I hope you put your name on and say yes. Come back and work with us next year. The second is to recruit. We want to grow this. This pilot was intentionally about 100 people, but we'd like it to be 7,000 people before too long. There's 700 churches in the East Metro. If they each had, what, uh, 10 people in, right? 700 times 10 is 7,000. We'd be at 7,000. It's not crazy. It's not crazy. We want to grow. So we're asking you, think about who is in your life who might like to do this with you. One friend, people from your house of worship, people, Jamie, from your exercise class, in your book club, Jamie recruits hands out cards in exercise class, in your family, in your neighborhood, your kids' schools, um, recruit. Let's get people in and grow this. So like council member Naker said, we really are transforming the city by the investment that we're making. We really can do it. We have these cards that you can hand out, and now I'm gonna bring Sarah up for the real close. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Randy.
I found myself, uh, as I listened to our partners and our volunteers speak, um, getting a little emotional. I, I don't want to call this an ending. It's just another continuation, another session. We'll start up again. But the impact that we have on our city is huge. I'm part of Winter Carnival, as some people will know. And that's a group of volunteers who spread this, the city of St. Paul and our love for winter. But when I talk to those folks about Opportunity St. Paul and the work that we're doing, and I shared some of these numbers on my Facebook page, I had those volunteers saying to me, how can I get involved after my year? How can I continue on the volunteer into the city that we love and we represent? And I keep telling them, like, come to these, we'll get you hooked up, we'll get them signed up. And it's sharing the stories, sharing Charlotte's story. Um, I got to listen to Cora Lee share a couple stories earlier tonight. When you share a personal story about your experience at Opportunity St. Paul, that'll help draw them in.